Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 375 for Tuesday, the 25th of November, 2014. 2014. <laughs> See, I've already started coding for 2015, and so I'm already thinking like that. Welcome to the show. And tonight we are going to continue our series on how to create a simple photo gallery using PHP and some HTML. We're going to learn how to format it in proper HTML as well. We're going to be creating the light box effect so that when we click on those little thumbnail images, they're going to pop up in a nice little window for us. So stick around. That's going to be pretty awesome. Sasha Dermatis over in the newsroom. How are you? Great. Hi, everybody. Hi, Robbie. Here's what's coming up in the Category5.tv newsroom. A Russian website is streaming hacked webcam videos from surveillance cameras, baby monitors, and even webcams on people's bedroom computers. Hackers are distributing pirated copies of popular plugins and themes for WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. But what they've hidden under the, under the hood could compromise thousands of web servers. Turn your iPhone into a VR headset for just $100. That's what a Toronto-based company is offering as a feature for their incredible up-and-coming iPhone case. Would you trade your iPhone for a BlackBerry Passport? What if BlackBerry <laughs> sweetened the deal by giving you $550 to make the switch? And if you could turn off all the ads on a website you frequent for just $1, would you do it? Google is willing to give it a try. Stick around. The full details are coming up later in the show. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Kid. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. Introducing Belltone First, a revolutionary new hearing aid. So small you can hardly see it. So comfortable you can hardly feel it. For the first time ever, you can control hearing aids directly from your iPhone. Pick up the phone, listen to music, and use your hearing aids like wireless headphones. Hear everything that matters. Try Belltone first. For a free trial, call 1-800-BELLTONE now. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Welcome to the show. I'm Robbie Ferguson. I'm Kelsey Jensen. And over there. Hi, <laughs> I'm Sasha Dermatis. I just wanted to see if you was paying attention. <laughs> Are you ready to pay attention? We're going to have a lot of fun tonight. We've got viewer questions as well tonight. Yes, We've do. got a ton of stuff going on. We've got limited edition Category 5 Technology TV t-shirts that are available and ready for you in time for Christmas. All you have to do yes. is get over to teespring.com slash Category 5. Do it now. I like how instructional you are with that. <laughs> Do it now. There's only a week left in order to get these in time for Christmas, uh, and then the campaign is over. These are, like I say, limited edition t-shirts. We've got the sweatshirts as well, the hoodies. You saw me wearing one last week. Very nice quality stuff. It's teespring, T-E-E-S-P-R-I-N-G dot -E -E com slash category five. Another way that you can support us uh, right now uh, is, and, and while you're fulfilling, fulfilling the Christmas list anyways, yeah is to go over to category5.tv and you'll see that uh, we have a support us and then affiliate links and our affiliate links let you shop at places like Amazon, eBay, B&H Photo Video, stores that you're going to buy from anyways online. Got to do some ordering. Uh, it, you might as well support the show. That's a really neat way for you to do it. Very good idea. And of course, category5.tv is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Cat5.tv slash TPN and the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, cat5.tv slash IAIB. Don't forget to head on over to our mobile website, m.cat5.tv. Mmm.cat5.tv. It's just so good. Oh, yeah. If you've got a mobile device, head on over there, scan that QR. 
You're going to have to rewind it now. I've, I've already played it, folks. Sorry. It's gone. It disappeared. You're going to have to rewind the video if you want to scan it. Sorry. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Last week, uh, I, I started a series on creating a photo gallery in PHP as we continue our basic to intermediate uh, PHP lessons and, and teach you how to uh, do some web development uh, from a coding, uh, like a server-side coding standpoint. So tonight, we're going to car uh, carry on with that series. This is uh, now part two of the photo gallery section of that series. So tonight we're going to be doing some exciting stuff. First of all, we're going to be making sure that this um, site conforms to basically HTML5 standard as far as the, uh, you know, the, the necessary headers being in place. You know, last week we just kind of, I just slapped it together. It was not very clean. But uh, we're going to actually turn this thing into a nice functional website. So the web URL that we're working with is cat, uh, pardon me, demo.cat5.tv slash 019. And if you bring that up in your web browser, you'll see through the course of this uh, demonstration, this series, uh, as we're learning this together, um, you're going to see that what I've done is I've actually renamed the files from last week. So we've got 374.php is the actual script running on the server, but I've also included a .txt so that you can actually read uh, what it is that we did here on the air. So tonight we're going to be working with 375.php, and when we're done tonight, you're going to see also 375.txt so that you can open it up and edit it. And um, John was wondering if he figured out, if you figured out why certain files wouldn't work last week. Uh, I didn't actually look at it because... You know what? It just it didn't seem to matter enough. Uh, I, I guarantee it was a permissions thing or something like that. I downloaded them. I uploaded them. It was just one of those things. We were live, and it didn't matter. But now that you've asked that question, I feel ashamed that I didn't look into it further <laughs> for you, Jot. So maybe, just maybe, I will do that this week, and uh, then I will report back to you uh, next week. How's that? Is that fair? I think that's pretty Sasha, fair. Sasha, sounds good? Yeah? Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So tonight... Here we go. We're going to head on over to this website here. We're going to go cat5.tv slash web dev. That's our web development page where it uh, just takes you over to a, just a ginormous resource of all different things that we've talked about on the show that have to do with web development. And if you scroll down, there are files that you can download. And one of those is blank index v2.zip. That's what I want to start with tonight. All right, I've got it. It was massive. There you go. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Within that zip file, you see that it's just a very basic template, uh, a layer, uh, basically just the HTML code that I'm going to need in order to get started with my website. That's just a handy little way to get started so you don't have to retype the same stuff. So you see that it's got the doc type declaration and then HTML and the header and the end of the header and then the body, and the body is where we're going to put all of our stuff the stuff that has to do with our code. So I'm going to get on over here and open up 375.php. And here's what I'm going to do. So we've got that from cat5.tv slash web dev, and we know that the PHP output that we want to have happen is going to happen within the body. So I'm going to cut that and paste it above here. So I close off my PHP. Oh, there we go. Now we've got that as part of our file. Now I just need to have the, uh, the close of the body and the close of the HTML at the bottom of the file. There we go. So now on 375.php, let's go back here. If I look at the source code currently, it looks like that. So there is no body tag. There's no header tag. There's nothing like that. But now that I've uploaded this, now that information is actually a part of the body. So it's nice and clean. That's proper way to do it because, uh, of course, the doc type declaration is very important. So it looks the same to the end user's browser. There it is. I've refreshed. It looks exactly the same, uh, but it still functions just like that. Cool. So backing up just a little bit, um, uh, even for your case, uh, for, for you, Kelsey, um, what we're doing is we're building a photo gallery using... Mm -hmm thumbnail images, and then larger images. Okay. We're doing that with PHP, so the output happens on the server side, but it spits out HTML for the, for the browser, so the end user's computer shows it like this. So that's what we built last week, essentially. And when I click on it, it zooms in on the picture. 
what we want to do tonight though, now that we've got the proper HTML output here, and there's a couple of different ways that you can do that, but I've just pasted it in outside of, notice that what I did is I closed PHP with that, pasted in my stuff, and then opened PHP again where PHP is going to take place. So that works fairly well, but what we want to do is I want to create the ability to now, when I click on those images, the big image, or the small images, the thumbnails, it's going to bring up a little pop-up window as opposed to redirecting my browser to the big image and then I have to push back and then I can click on the next one because that's not the way a photo gallery works right so we're just kind of learning and understanding how this how the, how to build this from scratch as we go so the tool that I want to use tonight is called fancy box 2 and you're gonna find that at fancy apps apps dot com and when you go there it's gonna redirect you over to fancy box all right, so nice and easy. You can click on examples there, and you can see what it is that we're trying to achieve, where when you click on a thumbnail, what does it do? It blows up in a nice little, it's called a light box. It's not a pop-up. It's similar to a pop-up in some ways, hey? But it's, it's still within the same browser window. You notice it's not opening new windows on my computer, and we can navigate through the photos that are part of the example set but it doesn't force me to read or, uh, use the back button on my browser or anything like that. So what I want to do is I'm going to look at the standalone version here so that I can look at the source code. Nice, easy thing uh, to do. And you know, some people have said, well, how do I best start learning how to program? And one of the easiest, probably the best ways for you to learn if you're, if you're that kind of person that is a bit of a do-it-yourselfer and wants to actually teach yourself is to look at source code. What better way than to see how people are doing things and, and try to mimic those things by um, using source code. If, you, if it's not for commercial purposes, you can probably copy it from anywhere just as part of your learning experience. And then once you get good enough, then you can start coding your own stuff. But what we're doing this for, this is an open source tool, but we're using their source to see what it is that we need. And so that I can easily demonstrate to you without having to retype all this stuff what it is that we need in order to do this. So FancyBox requires a tool called jQuery. And jQuery is a, a JavaScript library that gives you Ajax functionality and some cool effects. It's basically uh, the, you know, we used to, people used to use Flash in order to make cool effects on a website. Well, that is dead and that's not something that we do ever. <coughs> okay, keep that in mind. If anyone ever says, let's put Flash on the website, they probably mean they just want something fancy. You want to go the jQuery route or another uh, JavaScript library would be fine too. I, I tend to lean toward jQuery because it's good to focus on one thing and then you can get fairly good at it and uh, you're not splitting your time and resources between different libraries. So I know that I have to have jQuery in there, but you notice that their reference to jQuery is on the server. So what I can do is I can copy that, I can paste it into my header. Again, I don't have to do it that way, but I'm just doing it that way to save time tonight as we are live. And you'll notice that, okay, well, it's looking for that file in dot dot slash lib slash, uh, that doesn't exist on my server, right? So where are we going to get it from? We can download jQuery and put it on our server, but we've talked about it before in the, in the past uh, using cdnjs.com. And cdnjs is a distributed, um, cacheable system that uh, delivers all kinds of JavaScript code, CSS files, all that kind of stuff. So knowing that we need jQuery, and they're using 1.10.2, we can probably use any version, but let's go over to cdnjs.com, and you simply do a search for jQuery. And there it is. So I click on it, and now you see that the current version is 2.1.1 at the time of this broadcast. Here are the three files that are there jQuery.js, that is the JavaScript file that you can include in order to load jQuery 2.1.1. jQuery.min.js means that the file has been minified. Minified means that the file has been shrunk, almost like a form of compression so that things will load faster, so that it doesn't, um, so that the file is much smaller, so that uh, the responsiveness of your website is going to be better. So typically, unless you want to see the code um, that you're working with uh, during development, we're going to use, uh, during development, you might use jQuery.js, but during production, so once we're done, and when you know the tool, such as jQuery, we're going to use the .min.js. And then the min.map is basically a comparison of the two, I believe, uh, for different tools. Okay, so I'm going to go back over here, and where they are <coughs> including the local file. What do you think, Kelsey? 
Yeah. Paste it in right there. Do it. There we go. But wait, Robbie. You're, you're supposed to say that. But wait, Robbie. And then you say, why doesn't it say HTTP colon slash slash CDNJ? Yes, page? why? Why doesn't it have HTTP colon slash slash? I appreciate your participation <laughs> and your input into this conversation because that is a great question. When you look at the source, <laughs> one of the great things now, you know, there were dumb ways to do this before, but th these days this is the way to do it slash slash cdnjs is the same on my server as saying that Ooh. but why does it matter because what if i host this on a secure server and i want it to be that so slash slash means whatever pro whatever you are currently using be it secure or insecure that's the one we're going to load from cdnjs supports both so if your site is using a secure certificate which you know everything is kind of migrating that way where even sites that are not doing e-commerce we're starting to encrypt uh, then you you just use slash slash and then that way it will be it's like an either or without having to do any extra code mm -hmm. all right so that's good so now jQuery is loaded and we're ready to continue on and, and actually set this thing up so what else have we got here okay what else does it need now you'll see that there are a handful of things and you can read the documentation at fancyapps.com so what do you need you need the main C CSS and JavaScript or fancy box again same thing I can copy it right from their code and then I can go over to CDNJS and grab it or I can retype or whatever but again for the sake of tonight's demonstration we're gonna do it nice and quick jQuery dot fancy box is the JavaScript library so go over to CDNJS and do a quick search here I'm gonna go home and type fancy box all one word there it is you'll see a ton of files come up oh no not this t oh there we go yeah all right there we go Okay. That is a lot of files. Yeah, so we want fancy box dot what dot min dot js. Ooh. See, not dot js, and then that's going to give us the minified version. Now this is version two point one point five, which is newer, I guess. Than oh no, it's the same one that was on their website. That's cool. So now I paste that in as my JavaScript. So now it's not loading from the local dot dot slash source. It's loading from cdnjs. Cool. Now we need the CSS file for fancybox.css. And again, there's a minified version of that on CDNJS. Might as well use it. Make things make the web faster, right? Right. That's what I, it's, Kelsey keeps saying that. Yes. So there we go. So now if I save that and upload my changes and refresh, there it is. And look at my source code. You'll see that I've got those libraries now loaded. And if I click on them, if all went well, there's the minified version. Wow, that's right, a so each version. one, <laughs> yeah, and that's why there's no spaces and it's a little bit hard to read. Yes. Okay. So next up, we know. Okay, so now, last week we already created the gallery itself, the thumbnails, mm -hmm. the clicking to open the big images. Can you believe that? That's we're we're almost there. We're yeah. ready to now use this fancy box library in jQuery in order to turn that into light boxes. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Woo! Almost there. Almost there. Yeah. All right. So back here, all right, let's go back to Fancy Box. Look at the, now we've, look at all this extra stuff. Add button helper, this is optional. We know that we don't need this tonight. This is also optional, this is optional, blah, blah, blah. Okay, everything else is fine. We just use that as an example. Let's go back to fancyapps.com and you'll see, here are the examples. So I kind of like the way those look, all right? We're just going to go with good. we're just going to go with straight examples tonight, Kelsey. I don't want to get all fancy, and you can do that. You can learn about the different API um, settings that you can use for uh, for Fancy Box tonight. We're not getting fancy with Fancy Box. We're just going to use it kind of out of the box. Oh, no fancy Fancy Box. I know. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, it's still pretty fancy. That's out of, true. It's fancy out of the box. Whoa. Oh. <laughs> Them there. puns, though. They're gonna, they're gonna use that. They, it's free. I gave that to you tonight, Fancy Box. Okay, <laughs> back here. All right. Notice that the layout is pretty much the same, except what does it got? Class equals Fancy Box. And when I say the layout is pretty much the same, Kelsey, what I mean is, if you look at the source code of our system, our mm -hmm. PHP is echoing an ahref to the photo, and then the image source to the thumb. And if I look at the source of my file, it actually makes even more sense. That's the output. Right. So what's different about Fancybox? With their demonstration, with their examples, 
there is class equals fancy box and rel equals gallery one. Everything else, other than t there's a title as well, everything else is pretty much exactly the same. Right. So what does it mean? Okay, class equals fancy box is assigning a CSS class, which is also going to be used by fancy box in order to trigger the uh, loading of the fancy box um, application, if you will, on this ahref, a link. Rel equals gallery one means we're going to create a gallery and this is part of, this picture is part of gallery one. Mm. I can name it whatever I want. I can call it photos. I can call it my photo gallery. Whatever. No spaces. Probably, I mean, you can do uppercase, lowercase, under, underscores, dashes, things like that. But uh, so what that says is that now when I click next on this photo, it's going to go to this photo because it's also part of gallery one, gallery one, gallery one. You can have multiple galleries. Okay, so let's go, cla uh, we're going to grab that class equals fancy box. I'm doing a little bit of copying and pasting tonight just to show you and, and explaining as I go, just to show you how this, how this works. Notice in my PHP here, I'm going to paste that in. Now class equals fancy box, rel equals gallery one. So now when I save that and upload it, the output of my code now contains that within those ahrefs. Fancy. But you'll notice, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's exactly what we're, that's our point. You'll notice now it's, it still does the same thing. Okay. Well, why is that? We've included the files. We've added the stuff to our ahrefs. Yeah. But what we haven't done is we haven't tr basically turned on fancy box and told oh. it, now we're going to use anything with the class called fancy box. Ah. So if we jump back to their example, and you see how really, really simple this is. Okay, so there's the HTML, which was really just copying and pasting that into my ahref from last week's demonstration. Here's our JavaScript. Notice class, that's the dot, fancy box. So anything with the class of fancy box is going to become a fancy box ahref with the open effect of none and the close effect of none. We can change that down the road. Document ready, so it waits until everything the DOM is absolutely ready, and then it triggers this. So I'm going to copy that to my clipboard, saving us having to retype what's already been typed at the very bottom of my document here. I'm going to go script, and then close my script, and then paste in that little bit of information. So it's going to look something like that. Again, this information is going to be available for you on our website. You go to demo.cat5.tv slash 019, and you'll see the file called 375.txt. That will give you access to the actual source code that we're creating here tonight. Okay, so I'm going to save that. And because I have not changed any class names or anything, this should work uh, because everything is just left as it was. Let's go back here. And if I refresh my source code, you'll see that's now a part of my source. Let's refresh our page and click. Ooh, Look at that. It works. Click. Click. And now, what did I say about, uh, okay, rel equals gallery one. Right. Remember what that did? That. Uh, not entirely. She wasn't <laughs> listening, folks. <laughs> I was listening. I this forgot. is why I don't pay the co-hosts. <laughs> 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 it makes it so that these are all part of the same gallery. Oh, right. Right? Okay. Yes. Yes. You remember now? Yes, I remember Do now. Do you remember? Okay. <laughs> Jumping back over here, what does it mean? Okay, so I'm going to click on the first picture there. And the now next. when I hover over it, look. <gasps> It gives me buttons. a next button. It's got okay. buttons. Now I click. Yeah. Click. So little code for so much awesomeness. How do you like that? Look at okay. all the awesomeness. Next and final step here is to add a little bit of a title to the bottom, the footer of each image. So let's, uh, let's do that. We know what our images are. are. So I'm going to go over here. And um, now the way that I've laid this out, I don't really have a way to... Um, do this in an easy way from the array right now because I haven't specified anything in the array that gives me a title. So I'm going to actually add to the array, which I created last week. So that's a comma, title, and we're going to call the first one. That was, what was the first one there? I think it was you and That Hillary. was myself and Hillary. So Robbie and Hillary goofing around. There you go. So there's my first title, and I can do that for the next one. Title. We're not going to do this for every one, folks, because you're getting the concepts here, not necessarily having to see me create uh, the whole thing. So the second one is Sasha and I. Uh, we'll say Sasha is amazed. 
at whatever Bobby said. <laughs> it's typical of the show and how things go. That's how I feel you know. every day, Robbie. Is that how it goes? I am always amazed by everything you say. Aw, shucks. <laughs> Thanks so much. <laughs> little bit of sarcasm in the studio. It's palpable. <laughs> just, just a little bit today. A little bit. All right. So you see what I've done? I've created title as part of the array. I want to show you this because I've, I've done this in the past and I did this last week. We're going to do a print R dollar sign photos because I want you to understand what it is that I've actually just done to that array because I've laid it out a little bit differently. So looking at that, there's what my array looks like now. So zero, the first image, contains a thumb, a master, and a title. One contains a thumb, a master, and a title. Two contains only a thumb and a master. So what are we going to do? We're going to say, okay, back here at our code, we are going to, there are a couple of ways that I can do this, but we're going to take the easy way tonight because you can learn from what we do here. I'm going to go title equals quote, quote. It's empty. Now, an apostrophe dot dollar sign photo title. If I could type properly, there we go. Okay, so it looks like that. Nope, need an uh, apostrophe. There we go. And you understand why I put that apostrophe? That opens this up. So this is HTML output. This is PHP output from my array, the title. Now, of course, that's not always going to contain a value. Photo title is not always going to contain a value. That might fill up your log, so you might want to fix this up a little bit and have an if statement, uh, but we're not worried about that tonight. But what it's going to do, if it doesn't exist, is it's just going to have quote, quote. So it's going to be an empty title. No big deal. So let's go and save that and hit upload. Look at the source code of our file. Oh, I've got to get rid of the uh, print R and the exit of, at the top. I know Kelsey was just about to remind me of that. <laughs> there we go. Save, upload, refresh. There we go. Okay, so now you notice that the first two images have title equals, and then the title that I put in the array, and the this one here, and this one here contains title equals quote quote. Now I don't like that I don't have a space before the uh, the close of the image tag, so I'm going to just fix that real quick by adding a space right. There is a space right there. It's not giving it to me. Ooh. It's being tricky. Yeah, I've been getting... Th oh, you know what? It's probably minified because we're on Cloudflare. Probably. That's what it is, a little bit. Okay, so now that I've done that, you know that the title is all good. Okay. Now I'm going to refresh. What do you think is going to happen if I click on the third image? No title, right? Yeah. Let's click on the first. Where's the title? Oh, where is the title? Let's see. Where's okay, fancy title? box here. Look at our code here. Let's make sure that we've got it right. Oh, you know what I did? I put the title on the image tag. The title, pardon me for fancy box, my mistake is in fact on the A tag. All Ooh. right, so it's on the link itself. The title doesn't belong to the image. The title belongs to the A, href, the, the link. Okay, so here I'm gonna change that. I'm gonna paste it right there. See what I've done? Upload my changes. Refresh my source code just to show you what I've changed. There you go. So a title, Robbie Hillary goofing around. Okay. Mm. Refresh. Click. There, there you it go. Is. Okay. So my title now appears at the bottom. And if I go next, it's going to give me the t title there. Sasha is amazed at whatever Robbie said. Next, <laughs> there is no title. Next, there is no title. So there you have it, folks. That's uh, step two in our process of creating an image gallery. And uh, in the following weeks, we're also going to look at how to get PHP to load the files automatically from the folder. So if you've got a massive folder of images, we want to just create a gallery nice and simple without having to create arrays. Uh, and also we're going to learn uh, in, the, in the near future, in the course of this series, uh, how to allow PHP to take care of all the resizing. We started out here with an images folder with all the, you know, the thumbnails and the larger images all created already. Mm -hmm. We're going to we're going to learn how to let PHP do some of the work. Sounds like fun. Kelsey has an uh, an open inbox here. 
You've been looking yes. through some of the questions, and yes. we've got lots of questions. Don't go anywhere, because if you've got your questions into us, uh, we're going to be addressing those tonight. And if you haven't got them in yet, you've got something in mind, uh, I guess they could send them to you in the chat room, eh? Yep. Sitting there I'm eagerly. Eager, eager as a beaver. I'm waiting. I need more questions. <laughs> Get the questions into her or yes. email live at category5.tv. Mm-hmm. Don't go anywhere because uh, we've got a lot of exciting stuff coming up for you. We're going to be in the chat room. Say hi to you. And uh, we're going to throw it over to the newsroom. So, Sasha Dermatis, take it away. It's Tuesday, November 25th, 2014, and here are the stories we're covering this week. A Russian website is exploiting weak passwords for internet-connected cameras and streaming them to their users. Pirated CMS plugins and themes are being used to distribute a powerful backdoor to web servers. You sick at staring at a tiny iPhone screen? Why not turn your virtual I- or your iPhone into a virtual reality headset for only $100? BlackBerry is attempting to convince iPhone users to make the switch by offering them cash monies. And Google is testing an option for website visitors to turn off ads by paying a small fee. These stories are coming right up. Don't go anywhere. Operation Christmas Child is one of the great stories. It's unfolding in our lifetime. We are only seeing just the beginning of this project. And these children will change the world. I'm Sasha Dermatis, and here are the top stories from the Category5.tv newsroom. Authorities have discovered a Russian website that is streaming videos from more than 100 hacked places around the world. The site is streaming footage of a baby playing in South Korea, an empty crib from Abascon, New Jersey, cattle feeding from a small town in uh, in Austria. The Russian website is streaming live footage from people's bedrooms, shops, office buildings, laundromats, barns and stables. How is this possible? The experts are warning everyone with a webcam, home security camera, or baby monitor that they need to change the default password into a personal password, and one that's hard to get hacked. The Russian website takes advantage of the fact that users who have recently acquired a camera use the default passwords to get the device to work. Passwords like 1234 are the most common and hackers can guess them easily. There are also many camera manufacturers that put the default passwords online. The users go to that site, get the passwords, but they don't change it into something else after logging in. The Britain Information Commissioner's Office advises everyone to change the default password after getting a new video device like a camera, otherwise they might risk being streamed online on the Russian website. Authorities said that they have no legal power in Russia, so they, can't clo- they cannot close the website. Therefore, it's better just to warn people to change their passwords. Wow, ha- eh? Yeah. Can, that- I, can I say, you know what, the, the story and the way that the, and the law enforcement and everybody involved in this story has, uh, has been s- kind of spinning it makes it sound like it's all webcams and it's all surveillance video cameras and things. And that's mm-hmm. true because these days when you buy a DVR for surveillance, it's it's internet connected. People yeah. will demand that, hey, I've got to be able to look at it on my phone now. Mm-hmm. If I'm going to have surveillance at the shop, I'm going to have access to it on my phone. If I'm going to have surveillance in my house, which is becoming more and more common these days with break and enters and yeah. as the price of surveillance goes down and people say, hey, I can add a surveillance system for 400 bucks to my house that I can look at from wherever I am. So if I'm sitting at work, I can get access. So that's really real, right? Right. But what about all the routers? Right. Ah, (laughs) think about this. Not a conspiracy theory, a fact. You buy a router or you get the uh, local cable internet service provider to give you a modem that's got a built-in router and it has that default password or a really easily brute forced password and no ability for you to monitor if someone's trying to attack it. And uh, so they get in, and what do they do? They connect into your network through a VPN, because Mm -hmm. now they've got access to your router, they've got that ability, and that means that they are now part of your local area network. They can browse to your files, they can access your computers, they can access anything that is, even if it's not internet connected, but it's connected to your internal home network, 
they can access that because of your router. Nothing to do with cameras. But if you happen to have a camera on your laptop, which everybody does, it's built in. You look mm -hmm. above your monitor. Yep. There it is. Uh, and you don't know any better and you don't have proper firewalling set up and strong passwords on your firewall. Yeah. Even if your webcam, that webcam in your laptop right there is not internet connected, unless right. I open Skype or something. Mm -hmm. But a hacker going in through the router could access that computer, turn on the webcam, stream the camera feed somewhere else. That's just using the camera thing as an example because of the story. But So it's not just w cameras. It's it's, it's a lot bigger than that. It's the entire that if, system. And I think if you don't, if you have like a computer or something in your room, you oh, know, put it. Like that's a, put, creepy. That's put a sticker over the camera when yeah. you're Mic not using it. What do you do with it? the microphone? I guess you know. Here's an idea: go to a hardware store. We used to be able to go to Radio Shack and do this, and you can buy, um, you know, the end of. So if you want to repair the cable on your three three point five yeah. millimeter uh, headphones, mm -hmm. right? So you break the cable on your headphones, and you can buy the little attachment to yeah. fix it and so do a little bit of soldering job. But the neat thing about that little plug is that if it has no headphones attached to it, no microphone attached to it, you plug it into the microphone jack on your computer. Yeah. What does it do? Turns off the internal microphone because it thinks you've plugged in a microphone. Ooh. Ah, there you go. Yes. We have hacked the hackers. Yeah. A Stick little bit of electrical tape and a broken pair of headphones cable. <laughs> That's hilarious. How do you like that? It works. It works. It works. You, you know, go. here's a and great strong passwords. Yes. Yes. Let's just St say yes. That. Very important for the yeah. strong passwords. This is a great spin, though. As of yesterday, the oh, administrator what? of the site appears to have voluntarily closed it down. What? The site now reads programmer looking for a good remote job along with a list of skills and an email address. So in my opinion, this was sort of a ploy to get attention to kind of, you know, beef up a resume because now here he is saying, well, look, I can find you. Hire me. <laughs> <laughs> looking down the list of things you can do. Yeah, you can hack webcams. All right. Nice, nice. Got the job. Got <laughs> now. the job. Security researchers have discovered thousands of backdoored plugins and themes for top content management systems that could be used by attackers to compromise web servers on a large scale. The Netherlands-based security firm Fox IT has published a white paper revealing new backdoor, a new backdoor named CryptoPHP. Security researchers have uncovered malicious plugins and themes for WordPress, Joomla, and Drupal. However, there is a slight relief for Drupal users as the themes are only found to be infected from crypt as themes only are found to be infected from crypto PHP backdoor. In order to victimize site administrators, miscreants make use of simple social engineering tricks. They lure ad site admins to download pirated versions of commercial plugins and themes for free. The malicious oh. theme or plugin includes the backdoor, which would now be installed on the admin server. The backdoor can be controlled by cyber criminals using various options such as command and control, server communication, email communication, and manual control as well. The exact number of websites affected by the backdoor is undetermined, but the company estimates that at least a few thousand websites or possibly more are compromised. Now, this just leads me to say, like, if something seems too good to be true, if you're downloading ah. a pirated free version <laughs> of anything, there's a good chance that somebody's benefiting from that free download. Yeah, really. And yeah. Who, who's at fault in that case, right? I mean, they'd just be sitting there going, ha, 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 you downloaded illegal software, gotcha. Well, it's not like you, you oh, yeah. well, you're compromised, you've been hacked. No, you've stolen something and it happened to be laced with something else. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, who's at fault, yeah. right? Well, there you go. Here's great news. What is it? Samsung Samsung's Gear VR isn't the only device looking to bring mobile virtual reality to the masses. Toronto-based agency Cordon Media is building Pinch, an iPhone 6 and 6 Plus case that turns Apple's smartphone into an immersive VR headset for shopping and surfing the web. Wow. Pinch has launched a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo and is expected to ship in June for just $100. What? I know. $100? $100. Bucks? $100. While it looks like a little more than a thick iPhone 6 shell at first glance, Pinch unfolds into a slick pair of virtual reality goggles that uses your iPhone as its display. 
The headset includes two motion sensing rings, which, when used with the Free Pinch app, allows you to interact with virtual objects using hand gestures. This headset is designed less for gamers and more for mainstream audiences that want new ways to shop and use apps. Pinch has the potential to rival Samsung's $200 Gear VR, an Oculus developed headset that syncs with the Galaxy Note 4 to provide virtual reality content from partners like Marvel, Cirque du Soleil, and Temple Run. While Pinch is built specifically for iPhone, it has the advantage of being able to fold into your pocket, and it costs about half the price of Samsung's, pocket, uh, Samsung's product. So there you go. Wow. It fits in your pocket, and it takes less out. It's beautiful. Yeah, I love, love that. the concept. I can't wait to see this thing. I know. Now, now Toronto is, is so close to us. Is there any chance that we can maybe maybe trial or Well, you know what? Talk? They're going to be here on the show uh, in a couple of weeks' time. So there you have it. So if you want to see this thing, you're going to get to put this thing on. <laughs> this is fabulous. And, and get to see how this thing works. We're looking forward to that. I'll do the whole new segment with the... <laughs> pinch on my face <laughs> pinch my face <laughs> that's how it goes down right <laughs> now speaking of iphones or not blackberry is trying to convince iphone owners to switch to its passport smartphone by throwing in a financial incentive the promotion which starts monday promises as much as 550 dollars to iphone owners who trade in their handsets in favor of blackberry's passport the actual trade-in value depends on the iPhone, with the iPhone 4S uh, worth up to $90 and the iPhone 6 work, worth up to $400. BlackBerry then sweetens the deal by kicking in an additional $150 as a topper for each iPhone. The iPhone 6 Plus is not eligible. The deal will run through February 13th, but it's good only in North America. Customers must buy an unlocked passport phone, which will cost between $600 to $700 through either BlackBerry's website or Amazon. The trade-in amount comes in the form of a Visa prepaid card. Now, BlackBerry has lost not just market share, but confidence among consumers that it can survive and thrive as a mobile phone maker. So I wonder if this small bribe will be enough to get <laughs> people back. <laughs> I love that you just called that a bribe because that's it's, exactly how it comes what across it is. to me. It's literally what that is. It's a small bribe and it's not actually like cash. It's here, give me 700 of your dollars tra to trade in your iPhone and we'll give you a Visa prepaid card. So they're taking the iPhone. They're taking the iPhone. Do you think, what are they going to do with it? They're going to... They're going to see if it blends. Create a big... <laughs> what they're going to do. <laughs> test, wow. Test a couple. Now, Google has unveiled a project that offers web users the option to pay to visit sites rather than see adverts. Dubbed contributor, users can pay a monthly fee of between $1 to $3 for ad-free sites. When those who have paid their subscriptions visit a participating site, they will see pixelated patterns replacing the adverts. It has so far signed up a handful of websites, including Science Daily and Urban Dictionary, to test the system. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Robbie. That means that you won't see an advertisement. What you'll see is a pixelated box where the advertisement was. Yeah, it sounds to me that's basically what they're going for. Now, there is apparently going to be the option that you can as a content provider, substitute those pixelated boxes with a thank you for contributing message, which I think, even though that's probably not the default option, I think that makes a little more sense. Yeah, right? who wants to see a pixelated place where the ad it's was? It's almost because censored. Then you would then want to know what the ad was. Like yeah, I feel what, like what I would that? then try clicking it to see, okay, where will this take but me? Yeah. <laughs> they already have that. It's called Adblock, and you can download it for free in the but Chrome that, store. See, you raise an interesting point because that exists, but that hurts content providers. Right. This, on the other hand, Sasha, mm -hmm. as, you, as you're saying, this supports those content providers. Oh. As a content provider ourselves here at Category 5, if you were to install Adblock yeah. and go to our website, it, it, it almost, to me as a content provider, feels like stealing. Right. Because for every video that you watch costs us money. Mm -hmm. How would it be fair then that you are not paying for anything right. and not clicking on advertising and not supporting what it is that you're enjoying right. online? So Adblock Plus is that blocking it, whereas what Google is doing, if I understand you correctly, Sasha, is that they're 
allowing a supplemental almost a replacement so yeah you can you can support this with a dollar or three dollars and it's still going into the pocket of the uh, mm-hmm. of the content provider mm-hmm. now Is it's that, one to three dollars monthly so monthly. I don't know how yeah so I don't know how that will actually translate to yeah. your revenue for ads I don't I don't understand exactly how that would break down and that could yeah. be difficult uh, challenge for the users because if you go to if you frequent a hundred websites and like you can't yeah. like 300 bucks a month for me to be able to go to those websites and keep the ads off yeah or is it just a base cost of one dollar in which case the ads themselves that, that would generate revenue for say our site right would you wouldn't generate that same revenue i don't know that you would actually benefit in any way yeah, I know, because if you click an ad and I get $3 versus paying the $1 a month, for example. Yeah. Or if, if some ads, if it's $25 for a referral and then suddenly Google is now only giving you $3, mm-hmm. how does that support the av- the content provider? Mm-hmm. Bloggers and stuff, I can't see uh, paying um, on a monthly basis for every blog that I read because there are so many of them. Mm-hmm. That's all it is. It's almost as if there has to be a network of channels that you can appreciate and say okay i want to support these ones and lose the ads on that or do we just leave the advertising in place and click on them yeah click on them yeah click on them if you're interested because they are a source of revenue and ignore them if you're not i mean hopefully you have the common sense not to just be mad clicking on absolutely everything you see (laughs) (laughs) um now i should say others in the current trial include WikiHow, mashable and imager Access to the service is currently invitation only, and interested websites can sign up to be on the waiting list at contributor.google.com. For all your tech news with a slight Linux bias, visit the category5.tv newsroom at newsroom.category5.tv. For the for the category5.tv newsroom, I'm Sasha Dermatis. Thanks, Sasha. Hey, You're make welcome. sure you go over to cat5.tv slash green. If you love all that uh, green screening that we're able to do here, live chroma key, that's where you're going to get your own gear, cat5.tv slash green. And uh, then you can do all some fancy stuff. Get the kids floating around in space. Do Christmas scenes. Yeah. Christmas cards. Yeah. Right? Set up your yeah. own green screen and do a Christmas card shoot with the family. Yeah. And then print them on the new printer that you buy at shop.category5.tv because we have printers there because they're awesome. Do it. Another way you can support the show. Yes. Hey, Robbie, we hey. have new registered viewers, Smokey Joe and Major Dude 58 Welcome, that, you two. But I'd also like to say hello to um, Ian, who is a new, a new watcher that um, is a new big fan of Category 5 and also... Awesome. My family who are watching. <laughs> <laughs> to Sasha Dermatis' family and Ian in particular, welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in, and we love having you as a part of our community. Uh, thanks for being here. I hope you enjoy mm-hmm. all the, the fun stuff that we do here and uh, learn lots. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of interesting and, and, uh, and fun content. And if you ever have any questions, Ian, just pop us an email. It's live at category5.tv. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'd love to, uh, to source uh, answers for you and yeah. answer those questions. Speaking of questions that have yes. l- arrived by email, uh, what have, do we have tonight? We have quite a few. Our first one comes from Dusty Rhodes, and he wants to know, how do you make a part of one photo show up in another photo so it looks like part of the original? I'm assuming you know what he's talking about. I do. and yes. this And the way that, that I know <laughs> what Dusty is talking about, Dusty, first of all, thanks for tuning in and appreciate the question. Uh, nice, nice to hear from you. What this stems from is a conversation that happened on Facebook. Okay. A lot of stuff happens on Bookface. Bookface. All right. My good buddy, Scott Jackson, uh, posted a photo because he thought this was hilarious. Uh, After last week's snowstorm, Yeah. what was going on Mm -hmm. that the plows put mountains of snow in the middle of the road? (gasps) Oh like, gosh. what is that? So he, he took the selfie. I mean, oh, way to why go, wouldn't SJ. you? And, and why wouldn't you? And it's like, okay, what on earth is going on there? So I, of course, said, I, I replied to that. And I said, dude, dude, look out. Seriously, look out. And I sent him this. <laughs> <laughs> 
Perfect. And it just worked. And and so Dusty said, how did you do that? And so quickly, I mean, I, I posted that, I don't know, five minutes after he posted his little selfie and he's standing there and then all of a sudden there it is on his phone. So I said, well, hey, you know what? Send in a question. I think that'd be good content for the show. So how did I do that? Well, of course, I got onto my buddy's uh, Facebook um, photo and yeah. I clicked on the options and download. So I got a copy of the photo that I could work with. So, Dusty, I opened that up into a program that's absolutely free. It's called GNU Image Manipulation Program. For short, it is called GIMP, and it is available for you at GIMP.org, G-I-M-P, for GNU Image Manipulation Program. There's the photo that, uh, that Scott posted. And, of course, with this, you see that's a perfect ramp for a snowmobile or <laughs> perhaps a, a snowboarder or something like that. Uh, Erica's here. Erica, what do you think? Would that be a good snowboarder hill? She says, uh, be a good start, yeah, yeah. I would like to be there with my snowboard. Okay, do that. so what did I do next? I headed on over to Google, and knowing that I'm not doing this for commercial purposes or anything, I just was doing this for fun on somebody's <laughs> timeline, I just went over to Google Images, and I said, okay, hmm, snowbo uh, no, snowmobile jump. And I see all these photos. And so I'm looking at this photo here, Dusty, and I say, okay, well, what angle would a snowmobile have to be at? Now, obviously, that one's not going to work. So you just start scrolling through, and you say, oh, huh, that's kind of perfect. And you start imagining the, you know, how that photo would look on that jump. Okay, well, he's got mountains behind him. Obviously, he's flying through the air. So I'm going to copy the image URL. And then go back over to GIMP and go File, Open Location, and I paste the URL in there and go Open. And it's going to give me a copy of that that I can now manipulate with this free software. You'll notice, Dusty, that I'm on a different uh, operating system. This is called Linux. Uh, I'm actually using one called Point Linux, and it's also a free operating system, a, rep a substitute for Microsoft Windows. However, just to be clear, uh, GNU Image Manipulation Program is available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. So you're cool mm -hmm. regardless of what platform that's you like to that's use. That's actually a really good program. I like that one. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, so this is an alternative to, say, Adobe Photoshop. I'm going to use this Lasso tool because it's free select tool. That's what they call it. Uh, because, I, again, this is just for someone's timeline. I just want to do something rough and dirty and, and just get her done and get it up. And I'm going to use the plus key on my, my keyboard to zoom in. Notice that the resolution of the image is 646 by 306, which is fine considering Scott's original post was only 960 by 720. See where I'm seeing that up at the top? So I want to make sure that the resolutions are pretty decent because otherwise it's not going to work. And I can tell that by copying the entire image, pasting it in, and saying, oh, yeah, that snowmobile is probably going to be roughly the right size. Because if I position it there and I you know, change the translucency of it to show only you know, part of it, I can see, yeah, that's, that's about the right size. Right? So now let's delete that layer. And let's go back to the, uh, the image that I downloaded. Get that lasso tool. Free select or yeah, free select tool is what they call it. And now all I have to do is press the plus key here, Dusty, to uh, on this image to zoom in, and it's going to start to pixelate, but that's okay. And now I just simply single click, and now look, it's giving me this line. And now I single click on the next area, and see what I'm going to do is I'm really simply going to trace around, and it takes no time at all in the GNU image manipulation program. I don't have to be, be too specific because there's a lot of white in the background and we're dealing with a, an image that has a lot of snow and it, I don't have to get that critical too because I'm not doing this for pay. I'm doing this for fun for my buddy on his timeline. So I'll go around his head and da -da -da -da. if I want to bring that up and bring that out a little bit, I can drag those. Here I am with my free select. I just want to get the, the guy out of the background. See how quick and easy I can do that, Kelsey? Yeah, really quick. I'm using the mouse wheel to, to navigate left and right, up and down. So to go left and right, I hold in the left shift key on my keyboard as I use my mouse scroll wheel. To go up and down, I just don't hold any keys and just use the scroll wheel. Mm -hmm. It helps me to very, very quickly navigate, and you'll see that I can get around the snowmobile in a matter of just under a minute. I'm sure if you time me, it's going to be under a minute. So I'll go around the ski. There we go. And I, I'm sure, Dusty, you can see where this is going. Real simple stuff. 
but now I've got this marquee that's ant trailing around the snowmobiler. So if I zoom out, it looks like that. I can copy, so I hit Control C on my keyboard, then go back over to Scott's photo and hit Control V. Now I've got that snowmobile in my image with the marquee around it. I right click and I go layer to new layer. Now you'll see that I've got this layer over here on the left that I can turn on and off and I can move around by highlighting it, dragging with this move tool and positioning this where we want it. There we go. So you see how there's a square around that? I can either, that's because that's the size of that layer. It's not going to show up in my actual image. I can either select the big layer to sh show that, hey, that looks pretty cool, or I can actually change the size of my layer by, by going right click layer, layer to image size. And then that's what it looks like. So now I've got this la layer that I can move around. I can position it wherever I think it is going to work the best. And, and there you go. So now I've got this cool photo to post up on someone's timeline. It didn't take me any time at all to do it, Dusty. Um, so we're not wasting, you know, we're not wasting time. It's just, it was a fun thing to do. It was really, really quick to do. And we can do that kind of thing with free software. So, hey, why not? It's yeah. good for a laugh, right? And it, it makes Scott's photo make a little more sense. Yes. Why is that hill there? <laughs> oh, obviously, dude, look out! <laughs> There you have it. G uh, the GIMP, G-N-U Image Manipulation Program is GIMP.org. Yes. Do we have time for one really, really, really quick one? And Dusty, again, thank you for the question. Yes, I think we have time for one more really quick question. All right. Uh, so this is from Old Salt. He's, hey, Old Salt. He asks, he installed backsport, back ports on PL2X and then- Point Linux 2. Point Linux 2, yep. thank you. And then did an update. After updating, he installed a solitaire game using Synaptic Package Manager. That's what I do when I update. Today he had an update available, so we got that. And then he tried to start the Synaptic Package Manager, but nothing happened. He tried. He he says any ideas? He said, and also that he lost the shutdown and restart options. Okay. Um, synaptic is a hard word to say, so I give you kudos for trying synaptic? to say synaptic package manager uh, that's a tool for installing applications he said it's like sympathetic oh like, like a <laughs> combination of simpatico and synaptic it was okay. it was a hybrid service that you have just developed in your mind oh boy it's probably like very fast internet that installs things <laughs> very easily so it's synaptic synaptic, synaptic, synaptic. package manager all right there's an interesting thing that can happen during updates, and that's that um, sometimes packages change, and so the software that you're using may change the way that it operates. And one of the things with Synaptic Package Manager and shutdown and all that kind of stuff is it has to be run as what user? It's got to be run as super user. Mm -hmm. You can't halt a computer without sudo. You can't um, open Synaptic Package Manager without being a super user. You've got to be. So if we, uh, let's just bring up my computer screen here. If I go to, here's what's really, really cool. So preferences, uh, I think it's there. Uh, no, administrator, system administrator, synaptic package manager. So if I actually right click on system here, old salt and go edit menus. Now look, haha, -ha, there's my administrator menu and there's synaptic package manager. So if I right click on it, hold in and then let go on properties, I'll see the command that is being run. Synaptic PK exec. Well, hmm, after an update, it's not working. Why is that? Well, because Synaptic Package Manager requires being super user. Well, the application used to automatically prompt if it detected that it wasn't super user. So that was good, but now what do we got to do in order to make it work again? Let's, uh, let's simply add GK sudo, huh? Synaptic PK exec because you've got to be super user. So if I, if I add GK sudo, I'm basically forcing it to ask me for my password in order to launch synaptic PK exec. So now if I close that and I run system administrator synaptic package manager, there, there you go. It's going to ask me for my password and when I enter it, it's going to launch synaptic package manager no problem. That's all there is to it. With shutdown, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, you may start with uh, dropping into your terminal, to type sudo halt, and that will get you there. Or, or you can hit alt F2, type gk sudo in that case, because you're in the GUI, gk sudo space halt, and that will shut you down. gk sudo 
space restart will restart your computer for you. It's right. as simple as that to get around the problem um, that you're experiencing there. Yes. Wow, time flies when we're having fun, does it not? Yes, it does. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Thanks for joining us tonight. www.category5.tv if you'd like to check out the website. Uh, register as a registered community member. It's absolutely free for you. It's been a lot of fun having you here. Yes, thank you for coming. Kelsey, Sasha, good to see you. Yep. Sasha's waving at you folks. I got to switch over. There you go. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye. Thanks, Kelsey. Thanks, Sasha. Good night. Whoa, where's the button? There it is. <laughs> we hope you enjoyed the show. Category 5 TV broadcasts live from Barrie, Ontario, Canada, every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern. If you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.